I'm Kia. I'm back again. Daniel and I have just been able to work some things out. I've been uh, working out of my house uh, due to the virus. And it's just made me available. And he's been asking me to speak. So I've been here. And uh, it's nice to be here again. Before I bring the message, I just want to start out, I believe, where I left off last time, if you watched uh, last week, was I was going to share with you about the bringing together of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I'm going to share with you where in Scripture that symbolically it brings this all together. I was uh, taught several years ago that the Old Testament saints look to the cross and the New Testament saints look back to the cross. So one looks forward, one looks backward, but it's all about the cross. So let me share with you in scripture. I don't want to tell you where the scripture is. I want to read it to you because I don't want you to get ahead of me. And there's a reason and you'll see or you'll understand. I want to go though back to the Old Testament when Israel was about cross the Jordan. This is where it brings it all together. Here's what the scripture says. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Now therefore, take for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of, their, of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that come down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. Now, symbolically, what we're seeing here, you know, the ark is carried by the priest. The Jordan is overflowing its banks, if you read the scripture. And to cross over, God is going to again do a miracle with the water. But this time, instead of Moses raising a staff, it's the priest's feet who are carrying the ark going into the water. And we're just told that when they step into the water, the water is going to part and rise up as a heap. Now symbolically what we're seeing here is death. Now the Bible says that Jesus takes away the sting of death. If you know your Bible, you know, the Bible says that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. And that word propitiation literally means mercy seat. The Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat represents Jesus. Now, Jesus takes away the sting of death. When, he, when the feet of the priest go into the water, into death, and the water is parted so they can cross over on dry ground, that's symbolically Jesus taking away the sting of death for the saints so they can cross into eternity and there's no sting to death. So with that in mind, the Jordan is a river, which means it's flowing. Now remember God parted the Red Sea, but he's going to do something different here. What he's going to do is cut off the water and then stand it up, the part that's flowing down, into a heap. But listen to what he does. So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the Lord. And as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan and the feet of the priest who bore the Ark dipped into the edge of the water for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest. 
that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away. Now here's the question. All God had to do is heap the water up just far enough back for Israel to cross over. But he does more than that. The Bible said it not only heaps up, but it goes back a long way. So what's God trying to tell us? Let me read it to you. That the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam. It's right there in your Bibles. I'm reading from Joshua chapter 3. All the way back when Jesus took away the sting of death. He took the sting of death away all the way back. So from the time of Adam, who was the first man, until today, every saint, when they die and they cross over on dry ground, when Jesus took away the sting of death, he took it away all the way back to Adam. I want to share something with you this evening. It's a very serious subject matter in regards to eternity. Matthew 23, 11 says this. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Why did Jesus say this? He said it because eternity changes everything. You need to keep that in mind as I speak tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I thank you for the revelation from your word. I thank you, Lord, for the depths of your word, Lord. And the depth of your word is unfathomable to man. We can only gain, we can only glean from your holy word as your Holy Spirit reveals it to us. Lord, we pray that you reveal yourself to us through your word. That you keep us ever mindful that we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Be with us during this time. Open our hearts, our minds, and our souls to the hearing of your word. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Now I want to read something to you. Keeping in mind this evening that eternity changes everything. I want to turn first to the book of John. Chapter 13, starting in verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash disciples feet this is the last act Jesus did with the disciples together before basically all hell broke loose this is before they went to the garden they were together Jesus knowing he's about to be crucified says he took his garments off girded a towel around his waist and began to wash the disciples' feet. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, 
but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. He didn't say if you hear them. He didn't say if you understand them. He said if you do them. Wash one another's feet as Jesus washed the disciples' feet. I want to ask you something. Keep this in mind as we go forward this evening. What are the servants of the church? Do you realize <laughs> we all seek position, we all seek power. We all want to be noticed. We all want to be acknowledged. But according to Jesus, that's not a Christian. Where are the servants today? Luke 17, starting in verse 7, says this. And which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, these are Jesus' words, Come at once and sit down to eat. But will he not rather say to him, Prepare something for my supper, and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all things which you are commanded, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty. To do. Let me ask you, who do you know that's done all that Jesus commanded them? Who do you know that's done all? Yet Jesus says, if you've done all that I've commanded you, say, I am an unprofitable servant. Ladies and gentlemen, that means literally, I am a worthless slave. <laughs> When's the last time you saw someone introduced in a large church, on television, and they simply say, let me introduce to you a worthless slave? Why, the guest speaker of the evangelist, the pastor, would be so insulted he would probably walk out the door. Yet in Jesus' own words, we're to see ourselves. That doesn't say that this is how Jesus looks at us. Read the scripture. We are to look at ourselves as nothing but worthless slaves. I'm going to tell you, you can argue with me, but you cannot argue with the word of God. Where's the humility Humbleness that used to fill the men of God. I think it's gone the same way of the power that I spoke about the other week. When the power is gone, the fear is gone, man elevates himself, and we get in the mess we've got today. We have got to get back to the scripture. What is Jesus trying to tell us? Well, if we see ourselves as worthless slaves in this life. We shall be exalted in the next. But if we see ourselves as high and lifted up in this life, I want to tell you something. Eternity changes everything. And here's the promise, Luke 12, 37. 
Blessed are those whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself, speaking of the master, Jesus, and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. What a blessed time that is going to be for those who humble themselves and served in this life. Why? Because eternity changes everything. I want to share a story with you this evening from the scriptures. A story that clearly teaches that eternity changes everything. But a story so familiar to us, I wonder if we have ears to hear. For there is another lesson here. A lesson of one that rejected servanthood. A lesson also of a good man that goes to hell. Do you doubt me? Then let's take a look for ourselves at the scriptures. Turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke 16. Starting in verse 19. In fact, a very, very familiar story. And I'm afraid so familiar that we miss the teaching. Starting in verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. I know what you're thinking already. You're thinking, Wait a minute, wait a minute. You said you were going to give us a story in the Bible about a good man that went to hell. And I'm telling you, I just did. You just didn't hear the story. You want me to prove it to you? There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously, sumptuously every day. I can trade you across this county to the churches and show you many people that live sumptuously every day. They live in comfort. They have everything that they want. Same as a rich man. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate desiring to be fed the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Now, clearly, the rich man ate sumptuously. He ate well, and he ate so well, he had food to throw out. And the Bible says Lazarus desired to eat of that food. And you show me one place in the scripture. Where the rich man denied Lazarus the right to eat out of his garbage. Let me ask you a question. You wake up tomorrow and you look out your window and you see a putrid, sore pussed individual laying in your driveway, eating out of your garbage can. What are you going to do? Well, 
you want to tell the truth, probably what you're going to do is either one call call the police or call someone in the county to come and remove that person. Rich man didn't do that. The rich man was kind enough. He owed Lazarus. He owed him nothing. He wasn't a family member. He allowed him to lay there and eat the garbage. I'm not so sure he wasn't a lot better than most of us. And he said, well, see, I, the, only, the reason I would call and have him removed is because of my concern for his well-being. Oh, really? Then let me ask you this. Why, if he was laying by a garbage can three or four doors down at one of your neighbors, you wouldn't do anything? And yet, can we really say that we care? No, what we would say is, and I quote, that's their problem. If we're honest, I'm just asking this to be honest this evening. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. In fact, when the Bible says he, he was laid at the rich man's, that, that literally means to be prostrated prostrated by sickness. This was a sick man. A sore filled man. Laid daily and allowed to lay there by the master of the house. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. So one was carried up and one was buried down. We're already starting to see that eternity changes everything. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Lazarus was this nasty, filthy, worthless beggar laying by this man's garbage who meant nothing to him, and all of a sudden, he's gone from meaning nothing to him to meaning everything to him. He wouldn't allow Lazarus in his home. And now he'll allow Lazarus to touch his mouth. Why? What has happened? Eternity changes everything. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. Places have swapped because eternity changes everything. Skimming down to verse 27, then he said, Now, this is, I'm reading out the New King James tonight for a purpose. I'm about to read the verse where the transition is complete, where eternity has truly changed everything. Because now who do we have here we're looking at? We have a rich man and a beggar. A rich man and a beggar. And we still do. It's just they change places. I read to you the New King James Version. Chapter 16, verse 27. Then he said, I beg. The rich man, the man who had it all, the man who fared so much way every day now says, I beg. The transition is complete. The man who had it all is now the beggar. I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. Oh, to his father's house. Do you realize in these times, the most revered and respected person in the family was the father. Now, this beggar, this pus, sword, worthless nothing, now he's 
says, send him to my father's house. What is steam? The former rich man, the now beggar, now puts upon Lazarus. What is steam to want him to go to his father's home? He said, for I have five brothers that he may testify to them lest they also come to this place of torment. I'm going to tell you, this is a good man. He is in hell. He's burning in hell. He has no hope. He has no future. He has nothing but torments. Yet this man is still concerned about his family puts us to shame. How many people do we know that have multiple brothers or sisters? And the families are always in a quarrel, always fighting. Why? Most of the people I know that would go to hell that have siblings would want them to come and suffer their will. But not this man. I'm telling you, he was, by earthly standards, a good man. He's caring for his family. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. And we know that to be true. So many people today, they don't believe. In Jesus. Yet Jesus rose from the dead. From this story, I just want us to understand that whatever we're suffering in this life, whatever we're going through, the struggles, the pains, I assure you from the Holy Writ of Scripture, eternity is going to change everything. I've got a question for the prosperity preachers out there. We read this story. I want to ask you, I want you to notice two things. Number one, God never heals. Lazarus. And number two, God never changed his condition in this life. I don't know what the prosperity gospel preachers have to say about this, but the Bible is very clear. We may not understand the suffering we're going to have to endure in this life. I promise you this, eternity changes everything, and joy cometh in the morning. And if we'll watch for our Savior and keep our hopes high, if we'll be humble and servants, we're going to enter into an eternity. I'm going to leave you with something tonight. A reading from a book. And this book is titled, I know the, the, the camera is not that sharp, but it's titled The Imitation of Christ. And if you've never heard of this book, you need to get it. It is one of the two most published and sold religious books in history apart from the Bible. Now there's always disagreement and argument over which is number one between these two. But the two most published and sold works apart from the Bible, religious works in history are this book and John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Now this book was written in the 1400s and as far as I know has been in constant publication ever since. In fact, John Newton who was the old uh, captain of a slave ship who was saved, who wrote Amazing Grace. When he was saved on the ship, the book he was reading during the storm was the 
imitation of Christ. I want to read you an excerpt out of this. This is Christ speaking. He says, Son, be not dismayed with the labors which thou hast undertaken for me, neither let the tribulations which befall thee quite cast thee down, but let my promise strengthen thee and comfort thee in every event. I am sufficient to reward thee beyond all measure. Thou shalt not labor here long, nor shalt thou be always oppressed with sorrows. Wait a little while, and thou shalt see a speedy end of all thine evils. The hour will come when labor and trouble shall be no more. All is little and short, which passeth away with time. Do thy part well. Mind what thou art about. Labor faithfully in my vineyard, I will be thy reward. Write, read, sing, sigh, keep silence, pray, bear thy crosses man manfully. Eternal life is worthy of all these and greater combats. Peace shall come in one day which is known to the Lord, and it shall not be a vicissitude of day and night, such as is at present, but everlasting light, infinite brightness, steadfast peace, and secure rest. Thou shalt not then say, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Nor shall I cry out, Woe is me, that my sojourning is prolonged. For death shall be no more, but never failing health, no anxiety, but blessed delight and a society sweet and lovely. Oh, if thou hast seen the everlasting crown of the saints in heaven and in how great glory they now triumph who appeared contemptible heretofore in this world and in a manner even unworthy of life, doubtless thou wouldst immediately cast thyself down to the very earth and wouldst rather seek to be under the feet of all than to have command over so much as one. In other words, when you see what people in leadership positions, how they're judged, you will be so glad that you were never in a leadership position. Neither wouldst thou covet the pleasant days of this life, but wouldst rather be glad to suffer tribulation for God's sake and esteem it thy greatest gain to be reputed as nothing amongst men. Ah, if thou didst but relish these things and suffer them to penetrate deeply into thy heart, how wouldst thou dare so much as once to complain? Are not all painful labors to be endured for everlasting life? It is no small matter to lose or gain the kingdom of God. Lift up, therefore, thy face to heaven. Behold, I and all my saints with me, who in this world have had a great conflict, do now rejoice, are now comforted, are now secure, are now at rest, and they shall for all eternity abide with me in the kingdom of my Father. Lord, I thank you for this time this evening. Lord, I know the truth of your word that eternity is going to change everything. And Lord, those that have been willing to suffer in this life, Lord, those that have not sought notoriety, nor sought fame, nor money, but Lord, have been willing to live as humble servants, shall be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Lord, that's your word. That's your promise. So it's up to us, Lord. How are we going to choose to live the rest of our lives? Thank you, Lord, for sharing with us the key, Lord, to eternal glory. Give us servants' hearts, Lord, 
that we seek not our own glory, but only thine. In Christ's name I pray.